for this morning. I want to share with you both the history and the theology of a secret rapture and seven years of tribulation to follow. And at the outset, I want to say to you, the secret of the rapture is there is no secret rapture. There are three basic interpretations of Bible prophecy, and I'm going to share them for the sake of you who have an interest in history. There is what is known theologically as the preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy, and in that word, you see the word pre. That means the idea of tribulation and suffering to a great extent before the church, before ever the church was formed. Now, there are very few in the world today who hold to that view. It was originated in the 16th century by a man by the name of Alcazar, whom we'll speak more later. The second interpretation of the prophecies of Daniel Revelation and Jesus and the Apostle Paul, for that matter, is called the futuristic interpretation. And that is the one that is most largely held in the Christian world today, certainly in fundamental Protestantism. That idea was originated also in the 16th century by a man by the name of Ribera, of whom we'll also speak further. The third interpretation is not from Alcazar, nor is it from Ribera, but rather it's from God and from the Bible, and it's generally referred to as the historical interpretation. Now, I want you to open your Bibles, if you will, please, with me to Revelation chapter 1. We've used this passage many, many times, but of necessity must do it again this morning. Revelation is the last book, not by an accident, but for those who live in the very last days, just before Jesus comes. And on prior occasions, we have said that this verse from Revelation 1 is the fulcrum of the whole of the rest of the book. It's not only the key of chapter 1, but is the key to the understanding of the entirety of the rest of the book of Revelation and also to a broad understanding of the book of Daniel, of Daniel, which many refer to as the Old Testament apocalypse or the Old Testament revelation. If you're ready now, we're going to read verse 7. Revelation chapter 1 and the 7th verse. The reference, of course, is to our Lord Jesus, as you see in the prior verses. Behold, He comes with clouds, and a very few folks are going to be able to see Him. Quite a few folks are going to be able to see him. Most folks are going to, no, every eye shall see him, including those also who pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Now we're going to turn directly from here to Matthew chapter 24. This is often referred to as the Olivet Discourse. The context, as we have noticed on prior occasions, has to do with um, the temple. You remember the disciples with Jesus sit together on the edge of the Mount of Olives and they're looking now right back toward the temple and the disciples say, Lord, isn't it beautiful? And Jesus now begins to speak. I'm going to take up the reference at verse 1. Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 and following so that we can see the context of the warnings of Jesus and the comforts of Jesus regarding His next coming. They went out of the temple verse 1 of chapter 24 Matthew and the disciples came to him and said Lord look at those beautiful buildings and Jesus said yes but I tell you this one day shall come when there'll not be one stone left upon another that shall not be thrown down verse 3 as he sat upon the Mount of Olives the disciples came to him privately and they said Lord tell us about these things Obviously, during the prior verses, there were crowds of folks around, and I can suppose that their jaws dropped. Lord, isn't the temple beautiful? Yes, it's one of the wonders of the world. It's been refurbished with a lot of Roman money. Isn't it lovely? And Jesus said, it is indeed, but I'm telling you this, not too far into the future, not one stone will be left standing upon another, and that was shock therapy. You can imagine that. And so the disciples later 
come to Jesus privately, it says in verse 3. While they were on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Lord, tell us more about this. And what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the world? Now, it's important for us to note here in the context that the disciples are not asking, what is it going to be like when you come the third or fourth or fifth time? What's it going to be like at the end of seven years of tribulation? What's it going to be like uh, during the millennium? What is it going to be like? No, they're asking, Lord, tell us more about the end of the age. And when you come for your saints, tell us explicitly about your second coming so that we can be ready. And so when we write for our children and their children and to the terminal generation, they can know and understand what it's all about. The second coming not the third or fourth, but the next time you come. Now, I'm going to give you some verses for reference. We don't have time to read all the verses, but I know that you A students will put them down. Speaking to the same event, when Jesus comes on his rescue mission for the saints, David in Psalm 50 verse 3 said that Jesus will come and will not be silent. He will not be silent. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Beginning with the 16th verse, we memorized about our fourth night together the words of following verses 16, 17, and 18. We said that this was the passage that would save us from Antichrist. And I'm going to suggest that this morning as we worship, we repeat those words together. I'll begin them for you, and you take up with me as soon as you recognize them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with the 16th verse. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trump of god and the dead in christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet our lord in the air the three words that save us from antichrist we meet him not in rome not in salt lake city but we meet our lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the lord wherefore comfort one another with these words the lord descends from heaven with a shout he's coming for his saints the graves are open and the saints come out and the generation that's alive and ready and waiting to meet him are caught up together with him to meet our lord in the air and there's nothing ladies and gentlemen wrong with the word rapture it is from the latin and also from the french rapier to be snatched up instantly caught up and i long for that day the problem comes when you try to suggest that when Jesus comes back for his saints, it's going to be a secretive sort of a thing. The shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the, sh the blast is so great, and the earthquake that comes along with it, that the graves are broken wide open. God tears up the cemeteries. In Revelation chapter 4, I'm sorry, in chapter 20 and verse 4. Revelation 20, verse 4. Let's turn back there together. We studied only about three nights back about the time of the millennium, the thousand years, and we alluded to this on that evening, but must underline it tonight, this morning again. All right, Revelation chapter 20, reading now verse 4. These are the saints that are alive when Jesus comes in his second coming. I saw thrones. The saints sat upon them. Judgment was given unto them. I saw those that had been martyred for the word of God and the witness of Jesus because they would not do what now? Why were they martyred? Why did the saints lose their lives? Because they refused to worship the beast or his image. Now, if all I had upon which to base my faith and to know that there was no secret rapture, this passage would suffice. It would be enough. It's abundantly clear in, these, in this one verse alone, it's clear enough that the children can understand that those that are taken in the first resurrection, the saints that are sat upon thrones during the thousand years have already gained victory over the beast and over the mark. That's enough. But there's much, much more. I want us now to go to Matthew chapter 13. And we'll go back and forth and back and forth as we put line upon line and precept upon precept together as we look at this idea, this false notion, this theological untruth about a secret rapture and then tribulation to follow. Chapter 13 of the book of Matthew, and I shall uh, begin to allude to you, I guess, 
for want of time. That's the way we'll do it. But this is the parable of the sower. And, and it says that, um, that someone had sown bad seed out in the farmer's field. And at this time of year and in this part of the country, you folks will relate to that, won't you now? And then it goes on to say that the wheat and the tares are going to be together till when? Till the secret rapture and then suddenly all of, the, all, of the, all of the wheat is taken away and seven years later the tares will be burned up. Is that what it says? No, it says the wheat and the tares are going to be together until the very end time, until the final harvest, the wheat and the tares will be together. Now, from here we're going to go to chapter 24 of Matthew. And this again is the Olivet Discourse. And put in your notes together with it, Luke chapter 17 and verse 24. And we shall notice again the emphasis upon the next coming of Jesus when he comes for his saints. Matthew chapter 24, and I shall read firstly at verse 27. Matthew 24, reading at verse 27. As lightning comes out of the east and shines even to the west, show, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And you read the same thing over in Luke 17 and verse 24. As lightning... Having been raised in the Pacific Northwest, I had seen some lightning storms. I had gone out to fight fires that were lightning caused, and you folks, of course, here know about all of that. And I thought I understood fairly well about lightning. Oh, how wrong I was. Peggy and I were called to work back in the Washington, D.C. area, and I shall never forget our arrival in the Shenandoah Valley where we were going to make a home for the next three plus years. We had just picked up a new travel trailer in which to live while we were out doing evangelism. And Peggy, looking into the western skies, saw some really black clouds, some really threatening clouds. She said, "Hun, pull off at the next rest stop. Pull into the next rest area. And there was one a couple of miles down the road. And I pulled in. And she said, I want us all to go into the trailer and we're going to have lunch and we're going to wait out this storm. And so we did. While we were inside and Peggy making sandwiches, the dark clouds rolled overhead and the lightning began to flash. And there was no one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, and then the thunder. I mean, it would right now. And Peggy said, oh, I forgot the pickles. Would you go into the trunk of the car and get the pickles? I said, are you out of your mind? I was sure as soon as I'd step outside, I would fry right there. It was my first real experience with an electrical storm. A few months later, I had another. I was preaching at Military Circle over in Virginia Beach, messages just like we've been sharing together here. And in the auditorium, there was a skylight right down the center. And one night, I was preaching on the second coming of Jesus, and I was reading from Matthew 24 and Luke 17. And I was reading as lightning comes from one, and instantly the lightning ripped across the sky, and instantly the thunder clapped, and the windows rattled, and the people jumped. And I said, look, I'll do anything for an illustration. Just relax. That's lightning. Does that sound like a secretive sort of a thing to you? The next time Jesus comes, he says it's going to be the greatest public display that the world has ever seen. It's not going to be any secret at all, but a great public spectacle. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27, it says, at that time, the sky is going to be just filled with holy angels, and there are going to be earthquakes, and the, and the islands are going to sink back into the sea, and rocks are going to roll off of the mountaintops. We're going to meet our Lord in bad weather. And by the way, when we're having meetings and someone says, I couldn't come last night because it was raining. Couldn't come last night. Looked like it might snow a little bit. Sometimes I say to them, look, you better practice with me. We're going to meet our Lord in bad weather. <sighs> Revelation 14. Oh, say, it gets good now. Revelation chapter 14, and we're going to notice verses 14, 15, and 16. Revelation chapter 14, beginning to read at the 14th verse. And here again is the description. I looked, and behold, there was a cloud. And upon that cloud, there was one like the Son of Man. And he had on his head a golden crown, and he had in his hand a sharp sickle. 
And then another angel came out of the temple. He cried with a loud voice to he who sat upon the cloud. And he said, reap now, for the time of harvest has come. And the harvest is now ripe. And he that sat upon the cloud then thrust in his sickle, and the earth was reaped. I want you to put together there in your notes Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 14, verses 14 to 18, where it speaks about the same thing. And put also, if you will, please, Joel chapter 3 and verse 15, where it speaks too very plainly about the noise and all of the holocaust at the time of the second coming of our Lord Jesus. Now let's transition. I have seen, and I'm abundantly sure that the majority of you have as well, the bumper stickers that say something to the effect that in case of the rapture, this car will be unmanned. I was over in Portland, by the way, at a rush hour not so very long ago, driving along one of the roads paralleling the freeway, and I thought for a little bit maybe the rapture had happened, the way some folks were driving, <laughs> swerving in and out. And in case of the rapture, this car will be unmanned. And then there have been the songs, the marketplace is empty, trains rattle down the track, and no one is in the command chair, no engineers behind the controls. Airplanes veer off their courses because the pilot has been suddenly snatched away. Now, folks, I'm not the most comfortable flyer on any occasion. If I thought this was the remotest possibility, I'd never get aboard a plane again. The books, the movies. Guy wakes up one morning and, and as unusual, there is no aroma of fried eggs wafting upstairs from the kitchen. Did she oversleep? No, her side of the bed is empty and, and the sheets are cool. She's not there. He gets up and goes downstairs, and she's not in the kitchen. He looks in the family room, no, and the TV is off, no. Couldn't she have possibly gone to the next? Maybe she ran out for some milk. Now the car's in the garage. No, she didn't walk. Be too much like exercise. Well, she's in the backyard, maybe not. And he goes into the bedroom, and the kids are all gone. And suddenly then, it begins to dawn upon him. And so he goes to the front door and opens And there on the step is the morning newspaper with headlines bold, Jesus came during the night, and the saints are all gone. And his heart is heavy for a little while. And then he remembers, oh, I heard the preacher just a couple of weeks ago say that, that if the saints are gone, then that means only seven years. Some tough times in between, but I believe I can stand it about seven years and, and I'll jump on board and we'll all be together again in seven years David Wilkerson I admire greatly he was a pastor down in the Carolinas who felt the the call of God to go to New York City and begin a ministry to prostitutes and drug addicts and gangs and gang leaders and he wrote a book that was an instant bestseller the cross and the switchblade and then a sequel entitled Beyond the Cross and the Switchblade. And I want to read to you folks one little scenario from the second book, Beyond the Cross and the Switchblade. It's called The Letter to Bobby. Now listen carefully. What about those of us who are not dead but are alive during the second coming? Well, we'll go through a separation too, Bobby. Some are going to be singled out for very special and favorable treatment, while others are going to be left behind to go through the worst tribulation the world has ever seen. The Bible puts this vividly. Now, I want you to notice the scripture that he uses. It's Matthew chapter 24, verses 40 and 41. The Bible puts this vividly. Two will be in the field, one taken, the other left. Two grinding at the meal, one taken, and the other left. And then he goes on. Where will the fortunate one be taken? Well, the real Christian with Christ in the heart will suddenly be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, the prior verses about one taken, one left, he has put in entirety in his script. But when it comes to this verse uh, from 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, he only puts the verse in brackets. He doesn't put the full text there at all, just kind of an illusion. And I think we know why, because those verses we just repeated are abundantly clear that Jesus is coming personally, and he's coming visibly, and he's coming audibly, and he's coming noisily, and he's coming with every eye watching. 
every eye of those alive. And then he goes on after putting that verse in brackets. Fantastic, he asks. I should think so, Bobby. Think of the chaos that will be caused. Many cars are going to be without drivers. Some announcers on the radio are suddenly going to disappear. And some pilots on the jetliners are going to be snatched away. Now, you, by the way, will find that very same theology from nearly every televangelist that's out there today. You'll hear it from Hal Lindsey. You'll hear it if you read or listen to Tim LaHaye. You'll hear it from John Hagee. You'll hear it from Pat Robertson. And you'll hear it from uh, Jerry Falwell's university. You'll hear it everywhere that fundamental Protestantism is taught today, with very few exceptions. You'll hear it almost everywhere. Now, let me again go on record. Here we don't believe that. Here we've not bought into that idea. Now follow this thought too because it's vital. Everything from here on depends upon our grasping this next idea. The idea of a secret rapture and seven years of tribulation to follow passes or fails, stands or falls, lives or dies on one question. What happens to that one left behind? Two at the mill, one taking the other left. Two ladies grinding at the mill, one taking the other left. Two in the field, one taking the other left. This question, in what condition is the one left behind? In what shape is he left? Is he left behind to be ministered to by converted Jews three and a half years later? Is he left behind seven years later to be met by Jesus coming back with the saints? The whole idea of a secret rapture, of course, teaches two second comings, if you can imagine. Uh, uh, some are willing to go so far as to say, well, uh, the other is the third coming. The original coming, the first advent, of course, was when Jesus came as a baby. And then the second coming is when the skies are filled with holy angels and Jesus comes riding down the skies, not a lamb to the slaughter, but king of kings and lord of lords, crown on his head and scepter in his hand. He comes to redeem his saints. But then in this idea of a secret snatching away, there begins tribulation after the saints are snatched off. And three and a half years in, Jews, who ought to have done their job back in the day of Jesus or shortly thereafter, are suddenly converted. They rebuild a temple over in Jerusalem. And then from there they go out to do a mission job that, that ought to have been done hundreds of years before. And everybody gets a second chance to be saved. How many, many men I've had derisively say to me as I've appealed to them to follow Jesus and do what's right now. Well, look, if I happen to miss it this time, I'll jump on board during the, at the third coming or at the end of the seven years of tribulation. That idea, ladies and gentlemen, is a theology born in the mind of the devil himself to get folks to put off their eternal security, their eternal salvation. One has taken the other left. What happens? to that one that's left behind. In what condition is he left when Jesus comes in his second coming? Now, let me make a statement that I've made many times before, but there's the possibility someone is here for the first time. Lyle believes that God has his children in all denominations, in all churches. Here we never sit in judgment upon anyone's relation with Jesus. Here we believe that Jesus has as many of his Christian people in the Catholic Church as in the Baptist or in some other. We believe that there are many, as many saved in the Baptist church as there are in the Adventist church or any other. And so there is no malice here this morning. There is no prejudice. There is no superiority. Having said all of that, I want to take your minds again to the Reformation. Some have the mistaken notion that the Reformation was a simple matter of semantics. Well, we just don't understand these words the same. No, the Reformation was not a question of semantics. The thing that brought on the Reformation was the preaching of the books of Daniel, Revelation, and the Antichrist passages of Paul and Jesus, exactly like you've been hearing them here. Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, John Huss, and a score of others began to preach with great power that the Church of Rome was the little horn power of Daniel 7, the beast power of Revelation 13 and 14, the harlot of Revelation chapter 17 and 18, and the Antichrist spoken of by Paul and Jesus. And they had not only powerful voices, they had the Scripture to back them up. And they began to preach with great power and with great conviction. And I want to read you their theology so that you can see that Lyle is not setting up some straw man this morning. I want to read you 
a little bit about the belief and the preaching of Martin Luther. And by the way, let me further say that not only did Luther and Calvin and Knox believe this, but so also did the uh, Waldensians and the Lollards and the Bohemians and John Wycliffe, who died long time before Luther. And many say he died simply because he translated the Bible into the English language. Oh, no, it was a far bigger deal than that. He wrote a book entitled Of Antichrist and His Main, and he pointed to the Church of Rome as the Antichrist and the Beast Power. Tyndall, Cranmer, Latimer, Ridley, all of the reformers, while they disagreed about the meaning of the Lord's table and certain other matters, were in agreement that the beast of Revelation, the little horn of Daniel 7, was the Church of Rome. Now let me quote from Martin Luther. He's, by the way, making a reference to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 4 and following, the man of sin who sits in the temple and claims to be God. All right? And this he says, The papacy is the true Antichrist, of which it is written, that he sits in the temple of God among the people where Christ is worshipped. Now listen very carefully. I'm continuing to quote from Martin Luther. The papists want to divert this passage from themselves. They say that Christ and Paul are speaking about a temple to be later built in Jerusalem. Did you catch on there? By the time of Martin Luther, he said, the Church of Rome is suggesting that the temple that is being spoken of by the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians is one to be rebuilt over in Jerusalem someday. And then he goes on. That the Antichrist will sit there and he'll rule there. This will not do. It cannot be understood otherwise than it is speaking of the spiritual temple, which we all are. It is there that the papacy shall sit and shall be honored, not above God, but even above all that is called God. And so we see before our very eyes that many princes of the world regard the law of the papacy more important than the commandments of God. Can't this be rightly termed exalting and honoring Antichrist above God himself? And this is from Martin Luther's church postal from the 28th Sunday after Trinity from paragraph 24 and 20, paragraphs 24 and 25. And so when I say to you that the Reformation was the result of the belief that the papacy was the beast and the Antichrist, it's not Lyle's idea nor an Adventist notion, but rather it was the teaching of every single reformer. I have one more that of necessity I must share this morning. Martin Luther had a theological cohort and a buddy, and oftentimes they disagreed in certain areas. His name was Philip Melanchthon. And by the way, this professor, this scholar, particularly of the Greek in the New Testament, before his death said that the seventh day was the Sabbath. And Martin Luther, in response, said... If this guy doesn't hush up, we're all going to be obliged. And he was talking about the theologian Philip Melanchthon, his buddy. He said, if he doesn't hush up about the importance of the Saturday Sabbath, we'll all be obliged to keep it. Now let me read to you from Professor Philip Melanchthon. He's referring to Daniel 7:25 about the power that would think to change time and law. And there's only one of God's Ten Commandments that has to do with time, and that is the fourth. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it. Only six days you may labor, but the seventh is the Sabbath. Now listen to this scholar from the Reformation. He changes times and laws so that any of the six work days commanded of God, he'll make them unholy or idle if he wishes. Moreover, he will abolish and make unnecessary the Saturday Sabbath or change it into Sunday herein they've changed God's laws and turned them into their own traditions to be kept above God's own precepts and that was at the root ladies and gentlemen of the Reformation now under this kind of preaching under this powerful biblical back preaching people began to leave the Church of Rome en masse not just one or two who kind of got discouraged or disappointed with their pastor, but by the tens of thousands and then by the millions, the folks began to leave the Church of Rome. They were jumping off like rats vacating a, a sinking ship. 
They got out because they could no longer give their loyalties and their allegiances to the woman that sat on the seven hills, the woman dressed in purple and scarlet color, the beast power of Revelation, the little horn of Daniel 7, the Antichrist of Jesus, and the Apostle Paul. And they got out. And it looked for certain as if the Catholic Church was going to die. And you remember the prophecy that we studied last night from Revelation 13, that there would come a deadly wound. And it was inflicted by these preachers. And it grew and festered until the time that the Pope was taken captive by Napoleon Bonaparte. And so as the church began to show more and more the signs of death and decimation, the Pope decided to become proactive. His name was Pope Paul III, and he sent out an encyclical to all of the church leaders around the world. Now, this was a long time before the Internet. This was a long time before UPS would deliver your mail the next day for $25. This was a long time before you get on the telephone and be in contact with the pastor on the other side of the earth. At this time, it took months and months and months for a letter to get to the opposite side of the world, and so months would be involved, but Pope Paul III sent out his encyclical months in advance. He said, we're going to meet together in a great church conclave on December the 13th of 1545, and we're going to meet in Trent. At this time, it was a part of Austria, but the borders changed during World War II, and today it is Trento, Italy. We're going to meet at Trent. When the fathers convened and the majority were present in Trent, the keynote address was given by the Pope, and he said this, We must have two things out of this Congress. Number one, we must have preachers as able, as articulate, as powerful, as persuasive as Luther and Calvin and Knox and Huss and the others. And number two, we must have a reinterpretation of the prophecies of Daniel Revelation that point to the Church of Rome as the little horn and the beast. And he says, furthermore, we are going to stay here until we get the job done. We must have a reinterpretation that lifts the stigma from the Church of Rome. There's a book that's entitled Catholic Doctrine as Defined by the Council of Trent, and its author for you historians is Reverend F. Nampon, N-A-M-P-O-N, and behind his name you find S.J., and what does that mean? The Society of Jesus. Oh, by the way, could any of you folks guess where the nearest Jesuit university is? Where is it? Gonzaga over in Spokane. And if you haven't been there to go through that beautiful cathedral, you ought to do it. It's worth the day's trip just to walk through the cathedral. I did it again, only just a short while back. I want to read to you now, if you'll allow me, please, from Reverend Nampon's book, Roman Catholic Doctrine Defined at the Council of Trent, from page 103. Now listen. At the time the fathers of Trent assembled, there was a bitter, obstinate war declared against the authority, the institutions, the sacramental dogmas, and the discipline of the Church of Rome. All of this in the name of Scripture. These innovators, the Reformers, found in our sacred book, the Bible, that the papacy was Antichrist, that the Church of Rome was the harlot of Babylon, and that her traditions were old wives' tales. The priesthood, moreover, was the common property of all Christians. The church, therefore, a desolate mother forsaken by so many of her own children, seemed to be repudiated by the divine word. And for this reason, my dears, the Council of Trent was convened. How long would the council last? Eighteen years. Eighteen years. There had to be, for reasons of illness and other necessities, certain interruptions. It would require some to go back to the home place, some to go here, but there was, there was a group that was required to stay. And one of the main issues was this one, lifting the stigma from the church as regards this being the beast power. Other issues that would be dealt with at this time included the Lord's Supper. And we talked this morning in our question-answer session about the conflict between transubstantiation, the magic of the Mass, as opposed to consubstantiation, Jesus, His Holy Spirit, with the substance rather than magically transforming the substance in the very literal body of Jesus Christ. Moreover, they discussed and voted about the validity of baptizing babies. 
They discussed and voted to keep the doctrine of purgatory. They discussed and voted to continue to adhere to the idea of saints and, uh, and sainthood and having inside the church relics and images. They voted to keep indulgences, the forgiveness of sin, past, present, and future. And they voted at this time the index, a list of books that Christian peoples were forbidden to read. And at that time, the Bible was placed at the head of the list. Christian people could not read the Bible. Do you know why? Because the majority of them would fall to the notion that the beast power, the woman that sat on the seven hills, still dressed in purple and scarlet color, was the church of Rome. And so they were forbidden to read from the Bible. Two necessities, reinterpretation and powerful preachers. At this time, the Jesuit order was formed and founded by a Spaniard by the name of Ignatius of Loyola. He's known today as St. Ignatius. And it's interesting to my mind as I look at the thing historically that almost all of the theology that came out of the Catholic of Trent came from Spain. The, the Roman Catholic Council of Trent uh, came from Spain, from Spaniards. And so the problem was given out to the people, the leadership of the church from around the world. What shall we do? To whom shall we turn? To whom shall we look for reinterpretation of prophecies? And small groups broke up and little think tanks were formed. And then they met again on the floor in a general session and suggestions were passed down and then voted. And the vote originally was that they turned to a man by the name of Alcazar to bring to them a reinterpretation of the prophecies of Daniel Revelation. And the Pope said to Father Alcazar, go to the libraries of the church in the world and stay as long as necessary. Don't come back until you have a reinterpretation of those prophecies. And Alcazar left and he was gone for four years. And in the meantime, the father stayed. And back home, parents were dying and they were disallowed to go back to bury their own parents. They stayed on. And after four years, Alcazar came back and he read his dissertation and it went like this. The church of Rome could not possibly be the beast power, the little horn power, because the beast came before the church. And he looked back to the wicked persecutions of Nero and uh, Roman Emperor Hadrian and Diocletian's, Diocletian rather, and he looked back to the... Uh, to the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, who in Jerusalem took a pig and sacrificed it upon the sacred altar. And he said, there is the desolation spoken of by Jesus and, and Daniel, and Matthew 24 with Jesus, and, and a referencing to Daniel. There it is, the, the beast, the Antichrist before the church. And the fathers of Trent voted on this idea and they overwhelmingly rejected it. And it is today known as the preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy, the beast power pre-church. It was rejected. The fathers said it will never fly. It won't play in Peoria because Jesus said and Paul said, of your own selves shall men arise teaching perverse doctrines. This won't happen because of some pagan outside the church. This is going to happen, this false doctrine, this false teaching inside the church. And so it was rejected. And then it was asked, to whom shall we now turn? And the fathers came to the floor and they voted and they said, Father Ribera. Now both Alcazar and Ribera were Spaniards. And so the leadership said, all right, Father Ribera, you go to the libraries of the church and the world and don't come back until you have a reinterpretation. And Ribera left and he was gone for nearly 18 years. And when he came back, he read his dissertation and it's going to begin to ring some bells. He said the church could not possibly be the beast power, the little horn power, for that is all in the future. Jesus will come suddenly. It may even be today and he'll snatch away quietly and privately his people and that'll be the beginning of three and a half years of terrible uh, tribulation and, and then, then at the end of those three and a half years the, the Jews will rebuild a temple and go out to the world and three and a half years after rebuilding the temple then Jesus will come back. Seven years of tribulation in the midst of which Jews will become wonderful, wonderful missionaries. Now, I don't have time to turn and read and give you all of the theology that it ought require, but I can give you some references. You want to come to me later, whatever, uh, and I might even share one or two as we go along. But let me now give you a thumbnail sketch of exactly what Father Ribera had done. He had gone back to a prophecy in Daniel chapters 8 and 9, a prophecy that has to do with 2300 literal years and within that the longest of all time prophecies in the Bible there was a shorter time prophecy called the 70 weeks and Ribera knew and used the prophetic 
tool of interpretation that when you're studying a Bible prophecy and it speaks of a day, you interpret that to mean and understand it to be a literal year, 70 weeks. And he did the multiplication and he said that means 490 literal years. Now, this prophecy from Daniel chapters 8 and 9 is in response to a prayer of Daniel who's in captivity and every night from his bedroom he prays, How long, Lord? How long will your children be held in captivity? How long until Jerusalem is restored? How long until the temple is rebuilt? How long until your truth is again lifted up from, from the center of your people? How long? And the Bible says while he was still praying, an angel by the name of Gabriel came down and gave him the answer. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Seventy, four hundred and ninety years. Seventy weeks a day for a year. Four hundred and ninety years of probation upon the Jewish people. Four hundred and ninety years. How long? I suppose that Daniel was a bit discouraged when the thing was explained to him. Seventy weeks, four hundred and ninety literal years. These 490 years would share a common beginning date with the 2300 years and that would be at the command to go forth and restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And history is abundantly clear that that command was given by a man by the name of Artaxerxes 457 years before Jesus Christ. Now, in Daniel chapter 9 verse 25, it speaks about the final week of this probationary period. And tragically, what Ribera had done was to, to say, well, with 69 weeks, that, that's history past. That's prophecy fulfilled. But the 70 week, that's off in the future. And it'll begin when Jesus comes secretly in his second coming. And then seven years later, he'll come back with the church. He'll come back at the beginning uh, of that 70th week for the saints. And then seven years later, he'll come back with the saints. When you study the prophecies, ladies and gentlemen, it is abundantly clear even to a casual theologian that those 70 weeks of years, those 490 literal years, once begun, were never to be interrupted, never truncated, never cut off, never stopped for anything at all. And this theory today is known as the gap theory. The 69 weeks, that's already prophecy fulfilled, that's all about, but the 70th, that's off in the future. God said to Daniel, the final week of probation for the Jewish children will be at the anointing of the Messiah. Now right on time, exactly on time, Jesus went to the water and was baptized by John the Baptist and the dove came down and he was anointed for his ministry and God said, this is my beloved son, Please listen to him. Now, from the time of the dedication of Jesus and his ministry, there were going to be seven years of final probation for the Jewish children. God says, my mercy is going to be unbelievable. My patience really are unending. I'll show you how far I'm willing to go with you. The Beck Bible Daniel chapters 9 and following says that after the anointing of Messiah, three and one half years, Messiah would be cut off, not for himself, but for his people. What happened three and a half years after the baptism of Jesus? He was crucified on a cross. And the Jews encouraged his death, and the Jews turned him over to Pilate, and the Jews shouted, Crucify him, crucify him, release Barabbas, give us anyone. And God said, I'm not going to give up on you yet. I'll show you how much I love you. I'll show you how special you are to me. I'm going to give you three and a half more years, even beyond the time you reject my Lord. Now, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, during those three and a half years after the crucifixion of Jesus, the disciples were allowed to go almost without any, um, any reluctance throughout the city of Jerusalem and its surrounding environs, preaching the gospel of Jesus. For three and a half more years, they were allowed to operate in that sort of a way. But in the midst of the week, 
the sacrifice and the oblation would cease. It said in Daniel chapter 9, and just when Jesus died on the cross, he shouted out, it is finished. And it was at the time of the evening sacrifice. And the priest, says the historian, had the little lamb on the altar and had the knife raised. And there came an earthquake and the altar was shaken down and the lamb ran away. And the temple that separated holy from most holy was ripped in half. It is finished. And the sacrifice and the oblation was to cease. Cut off. If you want to further scripture, Genesis chapter 9, verse 11, where it says they're clearly cut off. That means to be killed. The disciples went on to preach now in and around and throughout Jerusalem for the next three and a half years. Now, I want to read to you folks a brief statement from a very careful historian, a very godly person, I think. For three and a half years, the authorities of Jerusalem tolerated the preaching of the apostles until the stoning of Stephen, the first of the Christian martyrs. Then the gospel went outside Jerusalem to the non-Jew, to the Gentile. The apostle Paul would call himself the apostle to the Gentiles. And the probationary period for the Jews as a nation, as special, as chosen, came to an end. And from that time on, and the Apostle Paul, by the way, is abundantly clear. From that time, they would be saved in the same way you and I would be saved. He says in Romans chapter 11 that the Jewish nation was cut off from the branch. And if they were going to be saved, they would have to be grafted in, just like we Gentiles. The same Apostle Paul would say, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, male or female, but we're all one. We're all the same. Now, we're going to finalize by looking at the context of Matthew chapters 24 together with Luke 21. So let's go there together finally. All right? Matthew chapter 24. And I don't want anyone falling out of the windows here. I, I don't want to experience the Eutychus syndrome. I know some of you are dozing now. It's been a while. And I noticed that uh, about five minutes till noon, about half of the congregation gets that nervous tick of the left arm. <laughs> well, I have a watch too, and I've been looking at it here. And by the way, it keeps perfect time. It keeps really good time. It is a Timex knockoff. <laughs> Matthew chapter 24. And I shall take up the reading then. Down at about verse 20. The disciples asked him, Lord, what will be the sign? Jesus said this and this and this. Verse 14, this gospel has to go to the whole world. And then verse 20, pray that your flight be neither in the wintertime or upon the Sabbath day. It's another sermon, but I'm going to dovetail it here. I've had so many folks say to me, well, I can find all of the other commandments of the ten in the New Testament except for the Sabbath commandment. God left that out as we came into the new covenant after Jesus died. And I said, no, no, this is the only one of the, all of the ten that Jesus, looking down to the very last day, said we ought to pray about keeping. Now, certainly, he wouldn't ask us to pray about keeping the Sabbath in the last days if it were unimportant, if we couldn't tell which day of the week it was, huh? Pray that your flight be not in the wintertime or upon the Sabbath day. There'll be great tribulation, such as never was from the beginning of the world or ever shall be. Except those days be shortened, there would be no flesh saved. But for, for the sake of the Jews who built the temple in Jerusalem, I'm going to shorten those days. No. What does it say then? For whose sake are the days of tribulation shortened? For whose sake? Come on now. For the sake of the saints. It's abundantly clear even in this verse that the saints are here during the tribulation. I'm going to shorten the tribulation for the sake of my saints. If any man says to you, Christ is there or over there, don't you believe it. For there will be false Christs and false prophets. They'll show great signs and wonders in much if, so much if possible. They will deceive thee. There they are. The saints are there. The very elect. Look, I've told you before. Now, this isn't a knee-jerk reaction Jesus is having. This isn't a flash-in-the-pan notion that crosses his mind as he gives this all of the discourse on end-time events. He says, I've warned you about this before. The context is about false Christ and false teachings regarding his second coming. I've told you before. Now, watch carefully. Verse 26. Wherefore, then, if they say, go out in the desert, don't you go out there. If they say to you, behold, he's in the secret chamber, do what now? 
Jesus is saying to his disciples and all of their followers down through the ages, if anyone tries to tell you that I'm coming secretly, don't you buy into it. And then he goes on to explain it'll be the greatest public spectacle the universe has ever known. As lightning flashes from the east to the west, so shall it be in the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Now we're going to go to the continuation in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapters 17 and 21 are really a continuation. And here we again find Jesus instructing the disciples about the end time. And he says, beginning in verse 26, As it was in the day of Noah, so shall it also be in the day of the Son of Man. What was it like back there? What was going on back there? Well, <clears throat> they ate and they drank and they married wives and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah went inside the ark. And then everybody that didn't get inside the ark with him got a second chance to be saved three and a half years later. No. What happened to the folks that didn't get inside the ark? The flood came and destroyed them all. And I can imagine the disciples' jaw dropping. Lord, really, is that it? And Jesus said, yes, and furthermore, as it was in the day of Lot. And then he goes through the same scenario. And he said the day that Lot left Sodom, fire came down and destroyed them all. And then he concludes, even thus shall it be in the day that the Son of Man is revealed. He that is in the house of, verse 31, let him not go back to get his things. He that is upon, out in the field, let him not return. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever will seek to save his life will lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life and for my sake shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed, one taken, the other left. Two women grinding, one taken, the other left. Two out in the field, one taken, the other left. Now, every preacher, every televangelist that teaches a secret rapture and seven years of tribulation to follow stops right there. And David Wilkerson, in his letter to Bobby, Stop right there. That's the end of it. But we're not going to stop there. You remember we said at the outset that this whole thing lives or dies on the question of what happens to the one left behind. Is he left behind to go through tribulation, get a second chance at salvation? In what shape is he left behind? Two men in the field, one taking one left. Verse 36. Two grinding, one taking one left. Verse 37. And the disciples asked him, Where, Lord? Where? Tell us once more. Could you make it more clear? Now, they're not asking where the one is taken. They know that. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare place. I will come again. They're not asking where the one is taken. They're asking for more affirmation. In what condition is the one left behind? And Jesus here answers it in verse 37. He answered and said unto them, Wherever the bodies are, there will the vultures be gathered. Left how? Left to be saved, left in what condition, get a second chance, left dead on the earth, destroyed by the brightness of his coming as we studied on another evening. Just as it was in the day of Noah, as it was in the day of Lot, they're left dead on the earth. I've told you before. Today is a day of salvation. Revelation 22, just before he stands up to return, verse 11, chapter 22, Revelation, he that is filthy, let him stay filthy still. He that is unholy stays unholy, but he that is righteous, let him re be righteous still. And probation closes the day Jesus stands up in the heavenly court and a few hours later comes on his rescue mission. Now listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Protestantism today has lost its protest. Protestantism today is divided into two camps. There are the liberals, those over on the extreme left, I suppose we could say, and they're demythologizers. They don't believe the Bible in a literal sense anyway. Take uh, the idea of second coming, a hellfire, a walking on water, water into wine. It's all just a myth, and they are not protesting. And then we move to the fundamentalist camp of Protestantism. And there we have the Southern Baptists, about half only now, tragically. And we have the Nazarenes and, and others that you could mention. And almost without exception, they're all teaching. No, it couldn't be the Church of Rome, the beast power, the little horn power, for that is all in the future, and they are not protesting. Now, what is Lyle's main concern regarding this whole idea? Is it the folks aren't going to be ready? No, that's a great concern, but not my main concern. This is the thing that bothers me most about the idea that folks are teaching that Jesus will snatch away the saints, and then three and a half years later, there's going to be a temple rebuilt, and three and a half years later, Antichrist come, the Antichrist will come. And what they have done, my dears, is taken the beauty of the gospel of Jesus, his ministry, his, uh, his uh, baptism, and his death on the cross, and given it over to Antichrist in the future. 
I want to say to you this morning, that is not another gospel. That is not another idea about the grace of God. That is a disgrace. Given to Antichrist, the beautiful atonement and the death of my Jesus. But I want to say to you today, the Reformation is not dead. And that torch that was lighted by Luther and handed on over to Calvin and passed to John Huss and John Knox still burns. And while we'll never protest against people or sit in judgment upon individuals, we must continue to carry the protest against false doctrines, regardless of where they have originated. We must continue to lift high the gospel light and go marching toward the kingdom, holding high the lamp of light. Thy word is a light unto my feet, a lamp for my path, and sing while we march. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine till Jesus comes. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the clarity of your word. You love us so very much that you long ago made provision for our frailties and our faults. Because our parents slipped and fell, you came and lived the perfect life in our place. On a life we never lived, on a death we never died, on a resurrection that we did not deserve, we hang our only hope of eternity. Thank you, dear Jesus, in your name, amen.